I've found over the last 20 years of my career that um, sports and entertainment, but specifically sports, is a pretty uh, unique platform to impact culture. And uh, I have very strong views about diversity. I have very strong views about how to effectuate change. My sophomore year in college, I had the opportunity to be the head lifeguard at a pool called Martin Luther King Pool in Indianapolis, Indiana. And it was a pool that was ready to be shut down. It was a pool that nobody wanted to be around. Uh, it was a pool, quite frankly, that we were looking at uh, whether or not we were going to keep it open. And it was that summer that really impacted me because what I found was it was, it was an opportunity to really talk to a bunch of kids, to get inside their heads, to learn a lot about their lives, and to realize that many of the kids that we were dealing with that summer, their whole vision was in the four or five square blocks where they grew up. That was one of the most important summers to me, uh, having grown up in a household where my parents didn't go to college, uh, not having a lot of people who provided leadership and guidance and role models in my life. It was, it was an important summer to me to become a big brother to many of the kids in that neighborhood. And what I took away from that whole experience was you have the ability through sports to impact lives. And I think that that was where the seed got planted for me very early on, uh, that, that one or two people can really make a difference and change the course of history if you just really have an impact on someone's life. So I got the opportunity to go to Notre Dame um, as an undergrad. And upon graduate, my mother was a, licensing practice, a licensed practicing nurse, and she wanted me to be the first doctor in the family. And uh, when I told her that I was graduating go to, to go to work for General Motors, uh, she actually didn't speak to me for about three years. I started to look around and, and think about the things that I'd like to do and I was passionate about. And I love people, I love solving problems, business was quite fascinating to me. Started to do some research and, and, and I kind of fell in love with the, the idea of going to law school. So after three years with General Motors, applied to Notre Dame Law School, went back to law school, I found out that the, uh, the week before we graduated, that I became the first African American to graduate from Notre Dame Law School with honors. And for me, it was probably one of the biggest achievements in my life. What it kind of told me was that I could compete with any student in the country in an anonymous way and graduate at the top of my class. And it gave me some confidence to go out and take a few risks and to follow my dreams. What I really wanted to do at that point in time when I graduated from law school was figure out how to become the best possible uh, lawyer that I could be. I got a call from a gentleman at a law firm called Baker and Daniels in Indianapolis uh, and the hiring partner was a Notre Dame grad as well. So we talked, we talked about sports and life and school and education and what it meant to be an attorney. I was offered a position as an associate at Baker and Daniels working for a, a gentleman by the name of Jack Swarbrick. Um, and Jack was the chair of the sports team at Baker and Daniels and he's now the athletic director at Notre Dame and became a very important mentor for me my entire career. I went back to basics. It was reading, it was research, it was writing, it was understanding the industry and Jack also sat me down and said you know sports and entertainment is one of those few industries as an attorney where People Magazine, trade publication and advance sheets are all important. Uh, you got to know a lot about the law, you got to know about the players in the industry, you got to know a lot about what's going on. And uh, that really kind of like set the tone for my professional um, career. One day I got a call at Baker and Daniels from Tony Gwynn from the San Diego Padres, who was looking at the back of the CD and he was a big fan of my client who most people had never heard of. And he was very nervous and he said to me, can you set up an opportunity for me to meet your client? I'd love for him to come to my church and do like a music workshop and in return I'll come do something with him with sports and youth outreach. And about a year into our relationship, he said, look, I really, I really like your skills. You know, I really enjoy the relationship that we're building. I'm about to negotiate the biggest contract in my career, and I'd like to know if you'd do it for me. And as we we're getting ready to get on the elevator, he said, you know, I've never really been, been comfortable with big law firms. And I'm sorry, but I can't have this law firm represent me in the negotiations. He said, I'm not paying them a million dollars. He said, but I'll pay you a million dollars, but you don't have to quit. So I thought about it for about two seconds. <laughs> uh, 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 he, he said, uh, he said, if you ever wanted to launch your own business, I'll give you, you know, I'll give you the money up front. I'll pay you over the next couple of years. We just started going to town and all the clients that I had at Baker and Daniels came with me. The firm was very gracious. I wound up having space in the building. We worked on projects collaboratively and I established a sports agency. As my, um, passion led me, I started to develop this niche in Christian music again. At one point in time, 80% of the revenue 
in Christian music as the industry grew to $700 million a year was generated by clients that I represented. I got a call from a friend of mine who was an executive said, you got to get down here for a meeting with Reggie White, Wayman Tisdale, and Terry Cummings. They want to start a Christian record label together, and I'd like for you to represent them. We got to spend a lot of time together talking, and Reggie said to me, you know, I go all around this country, and I talk about diversity, and I talk about helping people of color with opportunities, and I don't have one person on my professional team of color. He said, and so I'm getting ready to do the biggest contract in my career with the Green Bay Packers, and I made a deal with Jimmy Sexton and Kyle Rowe to be agents of record for the life of my contract, but I want you to be my agent. So we sat down and we did Reggie's deal with the Green Bay Packers. Reggie called me and he'd retired and become pretty reclusive down in Charlotte, North Carolina. Hooked up with Joe Gibbs and J.D. Gibbs and he started calling me every week about six, seven years ago. Man, you got it. This NASCAR thing is fantastic. It's a sport. It's completely fascinating. There's so many opportunities. And I was like, NASCAR, why would anybody? I grew up in Indianapolis, but why? I mean, why NASCAR is like, you know, there are a lot of opportunities. There's opportunities for growth and diversity. They said, just send me, send me hundred thousand dollars. We're going to start this diversity program with Joe Gibbs. Don't ask me any questions. Just come down here and, and you'll see. And um, I usually did what Reggie said. So I sent him the money and, and I went down there and I saw these, it was fascinating. These young men and women, minorities who would never have had access to uh, the sport because of the cost and everything else. We're learning everything about the sport, and a couple of them started to develop skills that warranted a look from one of the major teams. So Reggie and I looked at it, and he said, you know what, I, I want to be partners with you, and let's start a NASCAR franchise.